Okay, so I continue with second premise resistance. Given an output y and input x1 such that h of x1 equals to y, it should be computationally infeasible to find any other input x2 such that h x2 also equals to y. So you might think that why this is happening. This is happens because the output size is fixed, right, to m bits, but we didn't fix the input size. So the input space is really, really larger than the output space. So for this reason, many inputs will go to the same output. So collisions are inevitable, okay? So for this reason, these things will happen. They have to happen because the input space is larger than the output space. But we want this to be computationally infeasible, meaning that if you have x1 and y, it should be hard for you to find a different x2 that also gives you to y. Again, for a generic attack, you can try random inputs and expect to hit this value y after two to the n operations. Okay, this is the expected value. Again, a generic brute force attack would require this many operations. So, an example why we need second premise resistance. Assume that you want to check if somebody is modifying your files in your hard drive. So, you can store the hashes of all your files. Actually, you should do it. It's a good practice. If the attacker modifies the files, for instance, put a, a malicious code inside one of them, and if they can still obtain the same hash value, then the attacker can fool you, right? Because the software thinks that that file hasn't changed because the hash value is the same. But there's actually a Trojan inside it. So this is why we need second premise resistance. But actually, uh, in hash functions, sorry, in blockchains or cryptocurrencies, we require second pre-image to have the uh, integrity of the whole blockchain or every transaction. So this is really important for us. We will talk about security when we talk about Bitcoin, okay, or any cryptocurrencies. So the second pre-image resistance is really a must. Also, it is a must for when you uh, digitally sign something, because this way, if two different transactions have the same hash value, when people claim that they perform the first transaction and then they can deny it and say that they actually signed the second transaction because all both of them have the same hash value and digital signatures sign the hashes of the input, not the input themselves. Okay. So second image resistance is really important. Finally, we said that we need collision resistance. It should be computationally infeasible to find two inputs, x1 and x2, such that hx1 equals to hx2, okay? So uh, you might think that this is almost the same as the previous one, but in the previous one, we fixed x1. So in the example, consider that there is a file in your hard drive, so it is fixed. The attacker has no control over it. So x1 and y is already fixed. But in this scenario, I don't fix anything. I only give you the hash function and ask and challenge you to find two inputs that have the same output y. So you have more freedom here. This is why a generic attack actually costs less, like two to the n over two, the square root of the previous attacks. So this is much easier. For this reason, in order to have 128-bit security, we use twice the length of it. This is why we use SHA-256, because this attack actually halves the security. OK. This is due to birthday paradox. So why do we need a collision resistance? Hacker prepares two versions of a software for an operating system, let's say. And where X1 is the correct uh, driver and X2 contains a backdoor that allows access to the machine. So both of the control of the X1 and X2 is on the hacker, right? So they can choose X1 and X2 so that one of them contains a backdoor and the other does not. So if it, they can achieve this, if the hash function has no collision resistance, if they can achieve this, hacker then can send the X1 to operating system company for inspection, they will inspect it and say that there is no virus in it. So they will sign this driver, but not the driver itself, but the hash of this driver, right, with their private key. So once this happens, the hacker will put the X2 on the internet 
and distribute it so that people will download this driver, but when they will try to install it on their operating systems, the operating will, system will take the hash of this value, which will be the same as this. So they will realize that they already signed it. So they will the operating system will think that this uh, driver is uh, safe, which they already signed, and it is secure to install. But actually, it is not. So we have to have collision resistance and all of the digital signatures when we give some proofs, we assume that the hash function is somewhat collision resistant. When we talk about elliptic or digital signature algorithm, we have to rely on the fact that the hash function is used hash function is collision resistant. And since SHA-1 is not collision resistant or any previous ones like MD4 or MD5, this is why we don't use them in practice. Okay. So let me briefly explain what the birthday paradox is. So question is, how many people need to be in a room before it is more likely than not at least two people share a birthday, right, with probability larger than one over two? So there's an empty room, you keep people coming inside. So at which point uh, it is highly likely that is the probability is larger than one over two, so that two people in the room have the same birthday, okay? So uh, since there are 365 days in a year, people think that the answer to this question may be like 100 or 200 or something. So they expect the answer to be large. But in reality, we are not expecting you to find the second pre-image. We are not saying that this person has birthday at this date. So you know what is the probability that another person will have the same date? Instead, we have a group of people and we don't fix which two people have the same birthday. So it's possible that any one of them had the same birthday with the other one. So this way, if you calculate it, so consider the probability that nobody shares a birthday. The first person in the group has a birthday on a given day. So this has probability one. To avoid that match, when the second person comes into the room, we expect them to have a, another birthday. So out of 365 days in a year, they have to be born in the 300 and one of the 364 days. The one day we subtract here, actually the birthday of this person. Similarly, when the third person gives, the probability that the, the three of them does not share a birthday is the multiplication of these three values. So if you continue in this way, when T person enters the room, probability that none of them matches a birthday is this, okay? So what is the probability that they, one of them matches? So you just simply put a one minus here so that this will be the probability that they have the same birthday, at least one of them has the same birthday. So for every t, you calculate this probability. And when t is greater than or equal to 21, this probability value actually x is one over two. So when t is 23, the probability becomes 0 0.507, which is larger than one over two. So if you there are like 40 people in the room, uh, the probability you know reaches the 90% or 99%. So it's, it really increases in a very fast way. So this uh, answer 23 is a very small number. This is why we call it a paradox. Again, people expected to have an answer like a hundred or something but it is not that high. So uh, for this reason, uh, if you generalize this uh, birthday problem to uh, a generic problem, so instead of talking about the days in a year, if we talk about impossible birthdays and we have T people, then the probability becomes something like this. So when there are M possibilities, after making approximately t equals to square root of m choices, we have a collision with probability more than one over two. Okay, so this is the birthday paradox. This is why attacking here to a collision is easier than finding a second preimage or a first preimage. Okay. So we call uh, hash functions the Swiss Army knife of cryptography because we use it in many places. Uh, because you can use them for digital signatures, message authentication codes, pseudo random number generators, key derivation functions, and so on and so forth. This is why they are very useful, and this is why we 
use them extensively in a blockchain or a cryptocurrency.